Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. From the photographs I've seen of her, she has a slight but enchanting smile, as if she is about to reveal a wicked little secret. Looking at these, I wondered if she would like to be a sorceress. Did she ever think about it, as a child perhaps, to become a wizard? or consider applying to the Academy of Witchcraft? What kind of magic would she have chosen? Would she laugh a lot while enjoying a bit of malice now and then? But then I realized she made her choice. She has perfected the high and treacherously simple magical art of words. We all have the facility of language and use it much like we use knife and fork, blunt instruments to feed and speak our minds. We use these daily and it does not require a special skill, but to use the same knife and fork as a foil, a feather and a brush to create a whole new world in old words is magic. Suddenly there is life where there were only bread and wine. That is what makes reading such an exhilarating experience. This act of creation, although the subject of tenacious speculation by scientists of the mind, will always be a mystery. It is one of the human abilities that must escape explanation. We must do our very best not to be explained by them. It seems to be the only remnant of true religion, the one we really need, or is this an incorrigibly romantic notion? A writer reading other writers can be likened to a cook tasting other cooks' food. Sometimes you acknowledge the craftsmanship of a good plain stew. Sometimes you shudder at the exotic ingredients thrown in. Sometimes you are jealous because you don't taste any special flavor better than your own, and yet the cook has international fame. And sometimes you forget about analysis and you just enjoy the perfect combination of taste smell, color, texture. The latter is what happens to me when I read Margaret Atwood. She lets us in on her secrets without explaining them away and guides us through the inner landscape of her imagination. All of us have an inner landscape. Some maintain a more or less well-kept garden a plot of grass, a rose bush, a smelly heap of compost, a place where nothing grows, a flower border and a partridge in a pear tree. They sit contented in the sun watching the petunias bloom. Others have endless rows of leek and onions and potatoes, fertile soil for healthy fodder. No surprises there. All the more in those who contain whispering forests with secretive fens and insidious marshes, slushy lichens. And let's not forget the alpine people, their minds majestic mountains, cold, impenetrable, and awe-inspiring. Were I to paint Margaret Atwood's inner landscape, as it presents itself in her novels and short stories, I would say there was a piece of Iceland, fire under the snow, a sudden geyser of hot water in black volcanic country, next to the gardens of the Villa d'Este, warm-smelling dark green shrubs with shameless flowers and the continuous murmuring of water. There are the shrill sounds of screaming girls in a merry-go-round before we see them. And then we feel the hot and sticky wind coming from a slum, blowing fragments of papers against our legs. There are wide open spaces, 
where the heart rejoices and where you can breathe freely, but where one trips all the same over a turd and is bitten by mosquitoes. There are corners you never expected to round, turns you never expected to take, bridges you never expected to cross. Although there is silence, there is never boredom nor indifference. Margaret Atwood's inner landscape may be inspired by her own passion for travel. Her biography reveals a number of different places of residence, but her peripatetic lifestyle has never stopped her from writing. On the contrary, her many removals may have inspired this abundance of prose, poetry, and essays. She has been called the ambassadress of Canadian literature, not only because she has written about Canada and Canadian literature, but mostly because of the outstanding quality of her work, for which she has won numerous awards. Until recently, Canadian literature had a minority complex. Any self-respecting Canadian writer was published in the United States. Canadian novels too often revolved around the provincial theme of Canadian identity. But that has changed. Canadian writers decided to publish with Canadian publishers, widened their scope, and took their rightful position in international literature. No more looking to Big Brother America or ancestors in England and France. The position of Canadian literature may be compared, on a different scale of course, to Flemish literature. But I regret to say that although Flemish writers are among the best in the Dutch language, they still suffer from an unnecessary and energy-consuming minority complex, looking to Amsterdam while at the same time resenting her. Margaret Edward is here with us to present the Dutch translation of her latest novel, The Robber Bride. If Cat's Eye revealed the cruelty of little girls among each other, The Robber Bride extends this view to include adult women. It does not question relations between women in trusty feminist terms of victims and sisterhood, but instead she sheds light on the darker side of women as mothers, lovers, friends. Three women meet regularly for lunch. While they were not so close friends in college, the shared experience in different periods of their lives forged them together. Each of them let Xenia into their lives, at first out of friendship or compassion, but gradually they became her victim. She robbed them of their partners and their self-respect. She cheated and lied and insulted them. She violated their existence. Xenia disappeared but came back in a canister blown to ashes in Beirut. After almost five years of being dead, five years of relative peace for the three friends, they see her walking through the door of a restaurant where they are having lunch, more beautiful than ever. That dark lady of whom Shakespeare said, for I've sworn thee fair and thought thee bright, who art as black as hell, as dark as night. It is October 23rd. The sun moves into Scorpio. What did Xenia do to them and why? Who are those three independent, well-educated women and why did they fall for Xenia's tricks? Who are the men they were with? Then Margaret Atwood tells the stories of Tony, Caris, and Ross and Xenia. But Xenia is the only one we do not get to know from the inside. In the tales told from the perspectives of the three women, she reaches gothic dimensions, extreme in her beauty and wickedness. 
Although the novel has a very realistic ring to it in the way the characters are described, in the way their histories unfold, in the description of their surroundings and relations, The Robber Bride is a fairy tale in all its cruelty, with its sense of humor, its symbolism, its force, and irrationality. Miss Margaret Edward. I was, uh, I was firmly told that I was going to give a lecture tonight rather than read from the book, so I am going to give a lecture tonight. And um, the title of my lecture is Writing the Robber Bride, and its subtitle is Spotty-Handed Villainesses and Problems of Female Bad Behavior in the creation of literature. And let me say also that it's a real pleasure to be back in Amsterdam again. The last time I was here, my daughter was seven and made the acquaintance of chocolate sandwiches. She, <laughs> she thought she was in heaven. And now she is 17. So time has passed. It's a pleasure as well as an honor to be here with you this evening. I hope you will feel the same way. It does amaze me these days that people will actually turn out to see and hear a writer. After all, we don't wear spangled suits and have backup groups, a deficiency which makes me feel guilty from time to time. I feel I should be offering more visuals. <laughs> When people want to do TV shows on my life, I say, but what is there to see? <laughs> Not much, because what a writer has to offer takes place mainly inside the heads of the readers. But nevertheless, it's very agreeable that both you and I are here though I've recently developed the sneaking suspicion that writers should not give lectures, not merely because they're too much like homework to prepare, but also because writers don't really have a field of expertise. In saying this, I am not downgrading them, merely pointing out the obvious. Writers are among the last great generalists. If I were a dentist addressing fellow dentists or a plumber among plumbers, you would perhaps learn something of use. As it is, what can I possibly have to say that you don't already secretly know? But being a writer, and although some of the patron gods of writers are the dignified and beautiful muses, another one is the dishonest Mercury, god of tricksters and thieves, I frequently engage, at least imaginatively, in pursuits of which I disapprove. And so here I am giving, if not a lecture, at least something that might pass for one if you squint. My title is Writing the Robber Bride. My subtitle is Spotty-Handed Villain Villainesses problems of female bad behavior in the creation of literature. I should probably have said in the creation of novels because it's my novelist's outfit I'm wearing at the moment. Female bad behavior may occur in lyric poems, of course, but not at sufficient length. I began to think about this subject at a very early age. There was a mother goose nursery rhyme that went, there was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. When she was good, she was very, very good. And when she was bad, she was horrid. No doubt this is a remnant of the angel whore split so popular amongst the Victorians and so thoroughly analyzed since by literary critics, but at the age of five, I did not know that. 
I took this to be a poem of personal significance. I did, after all, have curls, and it brought home to me the deeply Jungian possibilities of a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde life for women. My older brother used this verse to tease me, or so he thought. He did manage to make very, very good sound almost worse than horrid, <laughs> which remains an accurate analysis for the novelist. Create a flawless character and you create an insufferable one, which may be why I am interested in spots. Some of you may wonder whether the spotty handedness in my title refers to age spots. I hasten to point out that my title is not age related. It refers neither to age spots nor to youth spots, once known as pimples. Instead, it recalls that most famous of spots, the invisible but indelible one on the hand of wicked. Lady Macbeth. Spot as in guilt, spot as in blood, spot as in out damned. Lady Macbeth was spotted, Ophelia unspotted. Both came to sticky ends, but there is a world of difference. What I am really talking about, of course, is how I came to write about the title villainess in my novel, The Robber Bride. Is it not, well, somehow unfeminist to depict a woman behaving badly? Isn't bad behavior supposed to be the monopoly of men? Isn't that what we are expected in defiance of real life to somehow believe now? I'll get around to the spotty women in good time, but first let me go over some essentials which may be insulting to your intelligence, but which are comforting to mine, because they help me to keep my mind on what I'm supposed to be doing. If I may appear to be flogging a few dead horses, horses which have been put out of their pain long ago in some happy but sequestered circles, let me assure you that this is because the horses are not in fact dead, but are out there in the world galloping around as vigorously as ever. How do I know this? I read my mail. <laughs> also on occasion, I listen to the questions that people ask me, both in interviews and during the question and answer periods after public readings. The kinds of questions I'm talking about have to do with what a writer should be doing and how the characters in a novel ought to behave. There is a widespread tendency to judge such characters as if they were job applicants or public servants or prospective roommates or somebody you're considering marrying. For instance, I sometimes get a question, almost always these days, from women that goes something like, why don't you make the men stronger? I feel that this is a matter which should more properly be taken up with God. <laughs> it was not, after all, me who created Adam so subject to temptation that he sacrificed eternal life for an apple which leads me to believe that God, who is, among other things, an author, is just as enamored of character flaws as ways to get the plots cooking as we human novelists are. The characters in the average novel are not usually people you would want to get involved with at a personal or business level. <laughs> How then should we go about responding to such creations? Or, from my side of the page, which is a blank when I begin, how should I go about creating them? Which leads to the further question, what is a novel anyway? Only a very foolish person would attempt to give a definitive answer to that beyond stating the more or less obvious facts that it is a prose narrative of some length which purports on the reverse of the title page not to be true, 
but seeks nevertheless to convince its readers that it is. As I said, Mercury is one of its patrons, and all writers are, among other things, con artists. But sometimes, when I find myself among readers, that is, among the trusting, I get confused as I discover that such people are not treating me with the suspicion that I deserve. They are not hiding the silverware and disbelieving my claim that I am actually the telephone repair person as they ought to do. Instead, they invite me with great kindli kindliness into their living rooms and expect me to tell them something true. We con artists do tell the truth in a way, but as Emily Dickinson said, we tell it slant. By indirection, we find direction out. So here, for easy reference, is an elimination, an, an elimination dance list of what novels are not. A novel is not a sociological textbook, although its true-to-life details must convince. If there's a brand of oven cleaner in it, that brand should actually have existed at the time. This is not, by the way, an argument for old-time realism, which left too much out. Nor is a novel a political tract, although politics, in the sense of human power structures, is one of its subjects. But if its main design on us is to convert us to something, whether that something be Christianity, capitalism, a belief in marriage as the only answer to a maiden's prayer, or feminism, we are likely to sniff it out and to rebel. As André Gide once remarked, it is with noble sentiments that bad literature gets written. A novel is not a how-to book. It will not show you how to conduct a successful life, although some novels may be read this way. Is Pride and Prejudice about how a sensible middle-class 19th century woman can snare an appropriate man with a good income, which is the best she can hope for out of her life, given the limitations of her situation? Partly. <laughs> but not completely. A novel is not a moral tract. Its characters are not all models of good behavior, or if they are, we probably won't read it. A novel is, however, inextricably linked with notions of morality because it is about human beings, and human beings divide behavior into good and bad. The characters in a novel judge each other, and the reader judges the characters. However, the success of a novel does not depend on a not guilty verdict from the reader. As Keats said, Shakespeare took as much delight in creating an Iago, that arch-villain, as he did in creating the virtuous Imogen. I would say probably more, and the proof of it is that I'd wager money you're more likely to know which play Iago is in. <laughs> But although a novel is not a political tract, a how-to book, a sociology textbook, or a pattern of correct morality, it is also not merely a beautiful structure, a piece of art for art's sake, divorced from real life. It cannot do without a conception of form and a structure, true, but its roots are in the mud. It may put out lovely lyrical flowers, but such flowers are built up out of the rawness of its raw materials. Novels are made of language, and language, being human, is messy. In short, the novel is ambiguous and multifaceted, not because it is perverse, but because it attempts to grapple with what was once referred to as the human condition, and it does so using a medium which is as slippery, stretchy, and hard to put down, namely, language itself. Let me share with you some of the problems that beset the practicing novelist. Let us say the practicing female novelist, although what follows can be extended to the more innocent sex as well. Literary critics start with an already written text. They then address questions to this text which they attempt to answer, 
What does it mean, being both the most basic and the most difficult? Novelists, on the other hand, start with the blank page to which they similarly address questions, but the questions are different. Instead of asking, what does it mean, they ask, is this the right word? The critic asks, what's happening? The novelist, what happens next? The critic asks, is this believable? The novelist, how can I get them to believe this? <laughs> the novelist, echoing Marshall McLuhan's famous dictum that art is what you can get away with, says, <laughs> how can I pull it off? As if the novel itself were a kind of bank robbery, whereas the critic is all too often liable to exclaim in the mode of the policeman making the arrest, aha, you can't get away with that. In short, the novelist's concerns are more practical than those of the critic, more concerned with how-to, less concerned with metaphysics. Any novelist, whatever his or her theoretical interests, has to contend with the following questions. What kind of story shall I choose to tell? Is it, for instance, comic or tragic or melodramatic or all? How shall I tell it? Who will be at the center of it, and will this person be A, admirable, or B, not? And more important than it may sound, will it have a happy ending or not? No matter what you are writing, what genre and in what style, whether cheap formula or high-minded experiment, you will still have to answer in the course of your writing these essential questions. And unless you solve the problem of how to interest the reader, at least a few readers, you won't have any. What this means in actual fact is that any story you tell must have a conflict of some sort and it must have suspense. This sounds like an elementary course in film writing, but it is nevertheless true for all that. Let's put a woman at the center of the hypothetical story and see what happens, keeping in mind that art is what you can get away with, that is, you have to suck in the reader, and that conflict and suspense are necessary. Now there is a whole new set of questions. Will the conflict be supplied by the natural world? Is our protagonist lost in the jungle, caught in a hurricane, pursued by sharks? If so, the story will be an adventure story, and her job is to run away, or else to combat the snakes or whatever, displaying courage and fortitude, or else cowardice and stupidity. <laughs> if there is a man in the story as well, the plot will alter in other directions. He will be a rescuer, an enemy, a companion in struggle, a sex bomb, or someone rescued by the woman. <laughs> Once upon a time, the first would have been more probable, that is, more believable to the reader. But times have changed, and art is what you can get away with, and the other possibilities have now entered the picture. Stories about space invasions are similar, in that the threat comes from outside, and the goal for the character, whether achieved or not, is survival. War stories, per se, ditto, in that the main threat is external. Vampire and werewolf stories are more complicated, as are ghost stories. In these, the threat is from outside, true, but the threatening thing may also conceal a split-off part of the character's own psyche. Henry James' The Turn of the Screw and Bram Stoker's Dracula are in large part animated by such hidden agendas and both revolve around notions of female sexuality. Once all werewolves were male and female vampires with the exception of Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla, were mere sidekicks. But there are now female werewolves, and women are moving in on the star blood-sucking roles as well. Whether this is good or bad news, I hesitate to say. Detective and espionage stories may combine many elements, but would not be what they are without a crime, a criminal, a tracking down, and a revelation at the end. Again, all sleuths were once male,
but sleuthesses are now prominent, for which I hope they lay a votive ball of wool from time to time upon the tomb of the sainted Miss Marple. We live in an age not only of gender crossover, but of genre crossover, so you can throw all of the above into the cauldron and stir. Then there are stories classed as, quotes, serious literature, which center not on external threats, although some of these may exist, but on relationships among the characters. This is where the questions really get difficult. As I've said, the novel has its roots in the mud, and part of the mud is history, and part of the history we've had recently is the history of the women's movement, and the women's movement has influenced how people read, and therefore what you can get away with in art. Some of this influence has been beneficial. For instance, whole areas of life that were once considered non-literary or sub-literary such as the problematical nature of homemaking, the hidden depths of motherhood and of daughterhood as well, the once forbidden realms of incest and child abuse, have been brought inside the circle that demarcates the writable from the non-writable. Other things, such as the Cinderella ending, girl marries Prince Charming and lives happily ever after, have been called into question. As one lesbian writer remarked to me, the only happy ending she found believable anymore was the one in which girl meets girl and ends up with girl. But that was 15 years ago, and the bloom is off even that romantic rose. To keep you from being too depressed, let me emphasize yet again that none of this means that you personally cannot find happiness with a good man, a good woman, or a good pet canary. Just as the creation of a bad female character doesn't mean that women should lose the vote. If bad, <laughs> if bad male characters in novels meant that for men, all men would be disenfranchised immediately. We are talking about what you can get away with in art, that is, what you can make believable. When Shakespeare wrote his sonnets to his dark-haired mistress, he wasn't saying that blondes were ugly. He was just pushing against the notion that only blondes were beautiful. The tendency of experimental literature is to include the hitherto excluded which often has the effect of rendering ludicrous the conventions that have just preceded the innovation. So the form of the ending, whether happy or not, does not have to do with how people live their lives. There is a great deal of variety in that department, and after all, in life, every story ends with death, which is not true of the novel. Sorry, I didn't invent it. <laughs> Instead, it has something to do with what literary conventions the writer is following or pulling apart at the moment. Happy endings of the Cinderella kind do exist in books, of course, but they have been relegated largely to genre fiction, such as Harlequin romances. To summarize some of the literary benefits of the women's movement, more inclusion, the expansion of the parameters available to writers, both in character and in language, a sharp-eyed examination of the way power works in gender relations, and the exposure of much of this as socially constructed, a vigorous exploration of many hitherto mysterious territories of experience. But as with any political movement which comes out of real oppression, there was also, in the first decade at least of the present movement, a tendency to polarize morality by gender. That is, women were intrinsically good and men intrinsically bad. To divide along allegiance lines. That is, women who slept with men were sleeping with the enemy. Women who wore high heels and makeup were instantly suspect. Defects in women were ascribable to the patriarchal system and would cure themselves once that system was abolished, and so forth. 
Such polarizations may be necessary to some phases of political movements, but they are usually problematical for novelists. If a novelist writing at that time was also a feminist, she found her choices self-restricted. We're all heroines to be essentially spotless of soul, struggling against, fleeing from, or done in by male oppression was the only plot to be the perils of Pauline with a myriad mustache twirling villains, but minus the rescuing hero. Did suffering prove you were good? If so, think hard about this. Wasn't it all for the best that women did so much of it? Did we face a situation in which women could do no wrong, but could only have wrong done to them? Wasn't that just falling into the trap represented by the old children's rhyme about girls and boys, in which girls were made of sugar and spice and all things nice, and boys of snaps and snails and puppy dogs' tails, excuse the phallic symbolism? Were women being condemned yet once again to that alabaster pedestal so beloved of the Victorian age when women as better than man gave men a license to be gleefully and enjoyably worse than women, while all the while proclaiming that they couldn't help it because it was their nature. Women were condemned to virtue for life, slaves in the salt mines of goodness. How intolerable. Of course, the feminist analysis made some kinds of behavior available to female characters, which under the old dispensation, the pre-feminist one would have been considered bad, but under the new one were praiseworthy. A female character could rebel against social structures, both sexually and in other ways, without then having to throw herself in front of a train like Anna Karenina. She could think the unthinkable and say the unsayable, she could float authority, she could feel and express pain and anger. She could do new bad good things, such as leaving her husband and even deserting her children and living with another woman. Such activities and emotions, however, were, according to the new moral thermometer of the times, not really bad at all. They were good, and the women who did them were praiseworthy. I'm not against such plots. I just don't think they are the only ones. And there were certain new no-nos. For instance, was it at all permissible anymore to talk about women's will to power? Because weren't women supposed by nature to be communal egalitarians? Could one depict the scurvy behavior often practiced by women against one another? or by little girls against other little girls? Could one examine the seven deadly sins in their female versions to remind you? Pride, anger, lust, avarice, envy, greed, and sloth without being considered anti-feminist? Or was a mere mention of such things, although we all knew they existed, tantamount to aiding and abetting the enemy, namely the male power structure? Were we to have a warning hand clapped over our mouths yet once again to prevent us from saying the unsayable, though the unsayable had changed? Were we to listen to our mothers yet once again as they intoned, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all? Hadn't men been giving women a bad rap for centuries? Shouldn't we form a kind of wall of silence around the badness of women, or at least explain it away by saying it was the fault of Big Daddy, or permissible at two, it seems, of Big Mom? Big Mom, that agent of the patriarchy, that pronatalist, got it in the neck from certain 70s feminists, though mothers were admitted into the fold again once some of these women turned into them. In a word, were women to be homogenized, one woman is the same as another, and deprived of free will, as in 
the patriarchy made her do it. Or in another word, were men to get all the juicy parts. Literature cannot do without bad behavior, as you will discover after one minute of reflection or a reading of Samuel Richardson's supremely boring goodness novel, Sir Charles Grandison. But was all the bad behavior to be reserved for men? Was it to be all Iago and Mephistopheles? And were Jezebel and Medea and Delilah and Ragan and Goneril and spotty-handed Lady Macbeth and Ryder Haggard's powerful super femme fatale in she to be banished from view? I hope not. Women characters arise. Take back the night. In particular, take back the queen of the night. It's a great part and due for revision. I've always known that there were some spellbinding evil parts for women. For one thing, I was taken at an early age to see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Never mind the Protestant work ethic of the dwarfs. Never mind the tedious housework is virtuous motif. Never mind the fact that Snow White is a vampire. Anyone who lies in a glass coffin without decaying and then comes to life again must be. <laughs> the truth is that I was paralyzed by the scene in which the evil queen drinks the magic potion and changes her shape. What power, what untold possibilities. Also, I was exposed to the complete unexpurgated Grimm's fairy tales at an impressionable age. Fairy tales have had a bad reputation among feminists for a while, partly because they'd been cleaned up on the erroneous supposition that little children don't like gruesome gore, and partly because they'd been selected to fit the 50s Prince Charming is your goal ethos. So Cinderella and the Sleeping Beauty were okay, though the youth who set out to learn what fear was, which featured a good many rotting corpses, plus a woman who was smarter than her husband, were not. But many of these tales were originally told and retold by women, and these unknown women left their mark. There is a wide range of heroines in these tales, Passive good girls, yes, but adventurous, resourceful women as well, and proud ones, and slothful ones, and foolish ones, and envious and greedy ones, and also many wise women, and a variety of evil witches, both in disguise and not, and bad stepmothers, and wicked ugly sisters, and false brides as well. The stories and the figures themselves have immense vitality, partly because no punches are pulled. In the versions I read, the barrels of nails and the red-hot shoes were left intact, and also because no emotion is unrepresented. Singly, the female characters are limited and two-dimensional, but put all together, they form a rich five-dimensional picture. Female characters who behave badly can, of course, be used as sticks to beat women, though so can female characters who behave well witness the cult of the Virgin Mary better than you'll ever be and the legends of the female saints and martyrs. Just cut on the dotted line and minus one body part, there's your saint, and the only really good woman is a dead woman so if you're so good, why aren't you dead? <laughs> Women were once provided with numerous cautionary tales featuring bad behavior followed by gruesome ends as a warning to us to stay indoors and keep our noses, etc., clean. But female bad characters can also act as keys to doors we need to open and in, as mirrors in which we can see more than just a pretty face. They can be explorations of moral freedom because everyone's choices are limited and women's choices have been more limited than men's 
but that doesn't mean women can't make choices. Such characters can pose the question of responsibility because if you want power, you have to accept responsibility for it and actions produce consequences. I'm not suggesting an agenda here, just some possibilities, nor am I prescribing, just wondering. If there's a closed off road, the curious speculate about why it's closed off and where it might lead if followed. And evil women have been, for a while recently, a somewhat closed off road, at least for fiction writers. All of this is background for the creation of Xenia in The Robber Bride. I would not say that Xenia is the worst possible human monster one could imagine. She isn't a mass murderer. She doesn't indulge in genocide. She doesn't start wars. Her aspirations are more modest. Instead, she is a kind of adventuress, like Becky Sharp in Vanity Fair and Undine in Edith Wharton's The Custom of the Country. She lives by her wits and uses men as ambulatory bank accounts. And she is also a trickster, thus belonging to a venerable tradition that includes the god Mercury, the North American mythological figures Raven and Coyote, the African spider god Anansi, the master thief of Grimm's fairy tales, Melville's The Confidence Man, Bergman's magician, and many another character who delights in delusion and lies. Story traditions love these figures. Not only do they keep, keep the plot cooking, but they represent a good deal of what Jung called the shadow. Many adventurers and tricksters are male, but it does make a difference if you change the gender. For one thing, the nature of the loot changes. For a male adventurer, the loot is money and women, but for the female one, the loot is money and men. The adventurous trickster is just one possibility for bad female characters. While I was writing this speech, I thought back over some bad female liter literary characters I have known. Not all written by women, it's true, but available to women now because if a character has been written, she can always be rewritten. Witness Rochester's Mad Wife in Jane Eyre, rewritten by Jean Reese in The Wide Sargasso Sea. If you were doing this on a blackboard, you might set up a kind of grid. Bad women who do bad things for bad reasons, good women who do good things for good reasons, good women who do bad things for good reasons, bad women who do bad things for good reasons, and so forth. But a grid would just be a beginning because there are so many factors involved. For instance, what the character thinks is bad what the reader thinks is bad and what the author thinks is bad may all be different. Also, motivations, actions, and consequences may be quite separate. But let me define a thoroughly evil person as one who intends to do evil and for purely selfish reasons. The queen in Snow White would fit that. So would Reagan and Goneril, King Lear's evil daughters. Very little can be said in their defense, except that they do seem to have been against the patriarchy. Lady Macbeth, however, did her wicked murder for a conventionally acceptable reason, one that would win approval for her in corporate business circles. She was furthering her husband's career. <laughs> she pays the corporate wife price, too. She subdues her own nature and has a nervous breakdown as a result. Similarly, Jezebel was merely trying to please a sulky husband. He refused to eat his dinner until he got hold of Naboth's vineyard, so Jezebel had its owner bumped off. Wifely devotion, as I say. The amount of sexual baggage that has accumulated around this figure is astounding. 
since she doesn't do anything remotely sexual in the original story except put on lipstick. The story of Medea, whose husband Jason married a new princess and who then poisoned the bride, bride and murdered her own two children, has been interpreted in various ways. In some versions, Medea is a witch and commits infanticide out of revenge, but the play by Euripides is surprisingly neo-feminist. There's quite a lot about how tough it is to be a woman, and Medusa's motivation is commendable. She doesn't want her children to fall into hostile hands and be cruelly abused, which is also the situation of the child-killing mother in Toni Morrison's Beloved. A good woman, then, who does a bad thing for a good reason. Hardy's Tess of the D'Urbervilles kills her nasty lover due to sexual complications. Here, too, we are in the realm of female as victim doing a bad thing for a good reason, which I suppose places such stories right beside the front pages, along with women who kill their abusive husbands. According to a recent Time magazine story, the average jail sentence in the United States for men who kill their wives is four years, but for women who kill their husbands, no matter what the provocation, it's 20. For those who think equality is already with us, I leave the statistics to speak for themselves. These women characters are all murderers. Then there are the seducers. Here again, the motive varies. I have to say, too, that with the change in sexual mores, the mere seduction of a man no longer rates too high on the sin scale. But try asking a number of women what the worst thing is that another woman could possibly do to them. Chances are the answer will involve the theft of a sexual partner. Some famous female seductresses have really been patriotic espionage agents. Delilah, for instance, was an early Matahari working for the Philistines, trading sex for military information. Judith, who seduced the enemy general Holofernes and then cut off his head and brought it home in a sack, was treated as a heroine although she has troubled men's imaginations through the centuries, witness the number of male painters who have depicted her, because she combines sex with violence in a way they aren't accustomed to and don't much like. Then there are figures like Hawthorne's adulteress Hester Prynne, she of the Scarlet Letter, who becomes a kind of sex saint through suffering. We assume she did what she did through love, capital L, and thus she becomes a good woman who did a bad thing for a good reason, and Madame Bovary, who not only indulged her romantic temperament and voluptuous sensual appetites, but spent too much of her husband's money doing it, which was her downfall. A good course in double-entry bookkeeping would have saved the day. I suppose she is a foolish woman who did a stupid thing for an insufficient reason since the men in question were dolts. Neither the modern reader nor the author consider her evil, though many contemporaries did, as you can see if you read the transcript of the court case in which the forces of moral rectitude tried to get the book censored. One of my favorite bad women is Becky Sharp of Thackeray's Vanity Fair. She makes no pretensions to goodness. She is wicked. She enjoys being wicked, and she does it out of vanity and for her own profit, tricking and deluding English society in the process, which, the author implies, deserves to be tricked and deluded since it is hypocritical and selfish to the core. Thackeray obviously prefers Becky to the goody-goody heroine Amelia and doesn't even punish her much at the end. 
She's a bad mother, too, and that's a whole other subject. Bad mothers and wicked stepmothers and oppressive aunts like the one in Jane Eyre and nasty female teachers and depraved governesses and evil grannies. The possibilities are many. <laughs> But I think that's enough reprehensible behavior for you tonight. Life is short, art is long, motives are complex, and human nature is endlessly fascinating and inventive. Many doors stand ajar. What is in the forbidden room? Something different for everyone, but something you need to know and will never find out unless you step across the threshold. If you are a man, the bad female character in a novel may be, in Jungian terms, your anima. But if you're a woman, the bad female character is your shadow. And as we know from the Offenbach opera Tales of Hoffman, she who loses her shadow also loses her soul. I will leave you with two quotations. One is from the literary critic Lewis Hyde. Why is the trickster the messenger of the gods? The second is from Dame Rebecca West, speaking in 1912. Ladies of Great Britain, we have not enough evil in us. Note where the evil is located in us. Thank you. Uh, I'm asking you please to go back to your seats when prompted so we have enough time for the second half of the program, questions and answers. Ms. Atwood will be signing books downstairs in the, uh, at the bookseller's desk right in the coffee room. And um, wait a minute. If you wish, oh yeah, you're, if you have any questions you would like to ask to Miss uh, Atwood, please put them down on a piece of paper and hand them in at the bookseller's desk. Thank you. The Sunday Times review by Peter Kemp starts with the remark that the Robert Bride is presided by the sign of Scorpio. There is a drawing showing you with a Scorpio on a leash probably symbolizing your masterful control over your novel, but you yourself are also born under the sign of Scorpio, as I am, so the drawing may symbolize your self-control. Are you a disciplined worker, or do you have bursts of creativity? Well, just to backtrack a little bit, probably he said it was presided over by the sign of Scorpio because I put that on page two. <laughs> 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 and he's a good, he must be an attentive reader. <laughs> but it is, it is true that I'm a Scorpio and we are not nearly so bad as our reputation would have it, don't you agree? Well, we can talk about it. <laughs> uh, now, the next part of the question was, am I a disciplined worker? I would like to say yes. <laughs> Shall I lie? Um, no. <laughs> As I would. I would like to be. Lie. Yes, they do. Lie. They do. They do. I would. I. I have an ideal um, picture of myself, the way I'm supposed to work, and in that picture, I get up at at eight in the morning, and I have my breakfast and my two cups of coffee, and then I sit down at my desk and I work di diligently until 12.30 or 1 and then I have lunch and then I come back and work diligently until about 4 o'clock and then my daughter comes home from school and then in the evening I also work diligently. <laughs> but <laughs> that hardly ever happens <laughs> because there are too many interruptions. I do take those things from hotels that you hang on the outside of your hotel door. It says, do not disturb. And nobody in my family pays 
the least bit of attention to them any more than they do in hotels. <laughs> you should put that sign on the inside of your door that you can't disturb the outside. <laughs> it doesn't help any at all. Uh, so in the hotel they say, we're here to check the mini bar. And in your home they say, I can't find my socks. <laughs> and other things like that, or they say, Mom, can I have an advance on my allowance? Mm -hmm. They say. But you are a disciplined worker then. I try to be, I try to be, but only when I'm writing prose. Poetry, it's a completely different affair. Why is that? I think that it's my theory that uh, poetry and prose are written by two different parts of the brain and my brother is a neurophysiologist, he works with brains, but I have yet to convince him to do the following experiment. <laughs> I would like to be able to wire up a novelist in the throes of composition, and you know how the, they show your brain on a television screen and it turns blue and green and red? I would like to be able to do that, and similarly with a poet at the moment of composition, and I'm sure that it would show that different areas of the brain light up. For instance, they have done this with music. They have trained, they have wired up a non-musical person and a person with musical training, and they have played both of them the same symphony. And the person with musical training lights up much more. <laughs> <laughs> How does poetry come about then? Come, it comes in waves maybe? I think poetry is more connected with the eureka in the bathtub experience part of the brain. Whereas I think the idea for a novel is connected with that part as well. But then as we know, novels are long. And you can have the idea for one in the same amount of time that you can write a lyric poem. But then you have to do it. You have to actually write the thing. And this can take years. So willpower comes into it but in much the more. The same. In the beginning, the, the Eureka experience, the sudden flash or whatever it is, I think is the same. Uh, in that it's unpredictable, you can't will it. You can't will yourself to have this happen. Um, and you can't, you don't know where it comes from. But how do you know what it's going to be, a poem or a, a piece of code? Well, it comes with the label on. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. I mean, unless you're writing long narrative poems like John Milton, you know that if you're having an idea that involves, you know, five different characters and a bunch of different plot elements, it's probably going to be a novel. <laughs> <laughs> so a long narrative poem uh, may be a confusion. Well, I don't the write them, mind. so... The wrong label. Yeah, I don't write them, so luckily I don't have this confusion. Um, Xenia, in the Robert Bryce, now again back to uh, uh, astrology, is the perfect Scorpio woman. She's hypnotizing, she's passionate, she's destructive. She is presented as the other woman, not only the paragon of the temptress, but also the dark side in every female. But isn't that a return to that age-old image of woman as a danger, the Mary Magdalene type, the 19th century femme fatale threat to a healthy family life? Absolutely. And, uh, aren't you? <laughs> But aren't you also <coughs> confirming uh, that image? That is to say that if a woman is to be feared, then it is for a sexual power? Well, there are, you can be fearsome in other respects, but it's not usually quite as interesting to write about. However, um, I'm thinking of Robertson Davies now, who wrote a, a book in which there were various spies at work. Uh, and he has one character say, of course, w women spies are different. They use their bodies, you know. 
you know, I didn't invent real life. I mean, it's just out there. But um, the interesting thing to me is not uh, why these women are around, because they always seem to have been around in literature from all countries. Sometimes they are women who are uh, deeply mythological and that they have another form. They are their other form in Japan could be a fox, for instance. Fox women are very dangerous because they're from the ghost, they're from the spirit world. And in our uh, English and Scottish tradition, and probably other cultures as well, there are women whose other identity is that of a snake. Uh, they're shapeshifters. So these, these kinds of characters have been around for a long time. The interesting thing to me was why they disappeared. Not, Did they yeah, they disappeared from film in the 40s and 50s, having been quite a potent force in film in the 20s and 30s. Witness Theda Barra, witness Verlaine and Dietrich in The Blue Angel, witness all those Joan Crawford characters. Barbara Stanwyck was good at those women. Betty Davis played some of them. And then. Right yes, she came back, but the interesting thing is why she disappeared. And I think she disappeared from Hollywood in the 40s and early 50s. Number one, because there was a big push towards domesticity after the war. The bungalow, the family, the four kids, the lawn. And you just can't imagine doing that with Marlena Dietrich out of the Blue Angel. <laughs> doesn't go with the backyard barbecue. <laughs> so instead there was Doris Day and Debbie Reynolds and June Ellison, and those were the movie stars I remember as a child. There were those kinds of characters. If you had an artist figure, it was likely to be Moira Shearer uh, in the red shoes, forced to choose between husband and career and getting squashed by a train. <laughs> uh, I mean, this was <laughs> alarming for our generation. And worse, worse to, comes to worse, you had Marilyn Monroe, who had sex but was obviously so stupid that, she, I mean, you couldn't think that she was a designing woman of any kind. She was the object of predation rather than the predator. The other reason I think they disappeared was that McCarthyism came in. And McCarthyism frightened Hollywood so badly but they were afraid to make serious movies of any kind for a while because they were uh, afraid of being accused of being communists. And this uh, predatory woman, this uh, sinister woman, is by nature a subversive character. Uh, the very least she subverts is the domestic order of things. Uh, because mommy, daddy, and the four kids, well, she might make off with daddy. And then the whole thing just falls to pieces. Uh, other than that, she was quite frequently cast as having something to do with the world of, of espionage, and that has a long tradition. As I said, it goes back at least to Delilah. But and why did she appear in the first place? Why did place? she appear in the first place? Why I think because... Born? Because, well, it isn't just a woman. As I say, there are all these amazingly juicy roles for men that involve great villainy, um, all of them concocted incidentally by men. I mean, it was not a woman who wrote Iago uh, or Mephistopheles in his many appearances. Uh, so there were lots of male villains, and I think you had to have a, a female villains to balance things out. You know, in early religions, there were male gods and female goddesses, so why not have male villains and female villainesses? But what's the difference between those male villains and those female villains? Then? They do different kinds of bad things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, but why is the female villain always connected with her sexuality? She's not always. She's not always. You can be an old wicked witch, um, for instance. You can be, the, the witches in Macbeth are not connected with their sexuality. In fact, they're sometimes played by men in, amongst avant-garde directors. Um, so those kinds of people, the, the evil stepmother is not usually connected with her sexuality. It's only some of them are. The, the adventuress figure is because 
an adventurer is a man who has adventures, often of a financial kind, whereas an adventuress is a woman who has adventures usually of a sexual kind. Why were they usually of a sexual kind? Because they were really about money too, but in the olden days, long, long before you and I were born, um, the best way of getting money if you didn't have any and if you were a woman was through a man or men. So the man could get money by having straight adventures such as robbery, plunder, and capitalism. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, the Hudson's Bay Company was called the Company of Gentlemen Adventurers, what can I tell you? Uh, there was no company of, of gentle, womanly adventuresses. Uh, <laughs> an adventuress was a woman who preyed on men. You know, she, she sucked them in and took their money. And this is still going on. In fact, it's now being done by computer, I'm happy to tell you. There is, uh, the computer network is the, is the perfect vehicle for fraud because you can't see who you're talking to. So therefore, you can pretend to be anybody. And there is a person, we do not know of which gender, who has been working the computer networks, uh, striking up computer friendships with men, purporting to be a woman, this creature, whoever it is, and striking up these friendships, then saying that she has developed a serious illness and doesn't have the money to pay for the medical bills, and these guys send her money. <laughs> she then vanishes from the screen. This is the whole... <laughs> and we assume that she turns up on some other internet under a different name. It's the perfect vehicle. A computer Xenia. Well, if Xenia were with us today, this is exactly what she would be doing, among other things. But uh, <laughs> Xenia, again, she is uh, an ambiguous figure, I think. She is a real person, but she's also a fantasy. It is impossible to decide, when reading your novel, what she really is. That made me a bit uncomfortable, but it seems necessary in the, in the, in the novel not to be able to decide what she is prevents the story, I think, from being either an ordinary case history or being a, a highly moralistic lesson. It also gives me the, uh, the impression of a superior device, an obvious frame that you do not try to conceal at all. But why did you decide to let five years go by between both of her deaths? And why did you have to do that last prank, staging her own death? Well, she explains that in the book, and we're not going to blow the plot. But of course, you always have to, <laughs> you always have to wonder whether to believe her or not. Uh, however, the first part, is she real or is she a fantasy? She is a person upon, upon whom other people project their psychic baggage, as it were, or their, the contents of their psychic lives. And this can be frequently observed in real life, the kinds of people that other people use as psychic projection screens are usually those with whom they are falling in love. You will notice how much bigger and more glowing and more wonderful such people are at those moments, and then how they strangely shrink and dwindle later on when this, some of this energy flows away from, energy that you have given them flows away from them. The other people that folks do this to are people that they really hate. And of course, recipients of a great deal of, of other people's psychic contents are public performers such as movie stars and rock stars get to be enormously larger than life because they're getting a huge amount of energy given to them by other people. So Xenia gets both kinds. She gets to be bigger than life because people fall in love with her and she gets to be bigger than life because she is the object of an obsessional hatred. And of course such people sort of glow with an inner fire because they are highly charged. And since you are seeing Xenia only through the eyes of three people for whom, whom she is an obsession, of course she has this surreal quality as people do in real life. Try being in the room when the woman who is made off with your beloved walks into it. But all the same, women come in all shapes and forms, just like men. 
There are no saints, no devils, just like men. In novels, nine times out of ten, women are described through the eyes of the male. They are defined in terms of their relations to the other sex and their function of wives and lovers and mothers. In The Robber Bride, the men are not to be held responsible for their deeds, for their acts. Oh, they oh, 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 watch. Careful. <laughs> I think they perform the tasks women used to perform their roles. They are reasonably stupid, weak. I don't, think, yeah, I don't think they're any more and stupid deep, deep. and weak than the women. I think, so. I think they are. Well, both the women and the men get taken in by Xenia, but it's only the men that get called weak, and that's because people have such high standards of behavior for men. You know, men are somehow supposed to be immune to this kind of thing. But the function that the men fulfill in the book is they are the loot. They are what gets stolen. And yep. just, right. to make, just to make the men feel better, let us point out that nobody breaks into your house and steals the plastic silverware. <laughs> but the attention is focused on the women. Yeah, the attention and is focused on the women. That, that's okay. They yeah. have power. That's all right. It's not about the relation between men and women. Not right? particularly, no. Um, <laughs> did you intend it as a kind of double mirror, one could say, uh, a mirror for the traditional male literature, but also a mirror to a feminist literature. Well, I think it's always fun to change things around. In fact, there's a section in the book in which um, Roz is looking at the children's books that she used to read to her children, and she remembers a time when her daughters, who were five or so, decided that all of their the characters and all of the children's books had to be female. And they simply insist on it, and if Roz says he, they shout her down, since there are two of them, they can do this. And they say, no, she, she. So, in fact, Piglet is female, Winnie the Pooh is female, Peter Rabbit is female, everybody is female. And the three little pigs are female, and so is the big bad wolf. And when it comes to the story of the robber bridegroom, who was a, a woman devouring monster, he has to be female too. So it's Tony who changes that to the robber bride and then says, I give you your pick. Do you want her to have women victims or men victims? But the twins, since everything has to be female, they, they, have, they choose women victims. And the point of that is, if you want the big parts, in the story. Some of the big parts are going to be bad parts because you can't have a story with no bad parts unless it's about Martians invading from outer space. Then all the human beings can be good and all the Martians can be bad. There has to be something bad. Otherwise it's... I remember my daughter and her friend Heather when they were about six they told us that they were going to put on a play and that we had to watch this play. So we sat down to watch the play. And the play was, they got up in the morning and they had breakfast. <laughs> and then they had, they poured each other cups of tea and they passed each other the cereal and asked whether they wanted more cereal and more tea. And it went on for a while. And <laughs> we said to them, finally, you know, this isn't a play. <laughs> In a play, something has to happen. <laughs> they thought we should just sit there watching them have breakfast. <laughs> we said, we will not watch this play anymore until you come up with an event. And their plays improved a lot after that. <laughs> well, then they, then they got into uh, more or less robbery stories or they developed this horrible game when they were a little bit older, uh, which consisted of some of the little girls being employers and the others being maids. And the, <laughs> the story would consist of, of the maid character being interviewed by the employer and then hired. And then the maid would do everything wrong and the employer would yell at the maid for doing these wrong things and then eventually fire the maid. And then they would switch around and <laughs> the one they wanted to be was the maid. 
<laughs> yes, because the maid was the subversive character. The maid was the one that was supposed to be subservient and obedient, but did everything wrong on purpose. You see. That, that's a change in character, too. Yes, but invented by them. Uh, I think what I'm pointing out is that if you try to have a, a, a story in which everybody is good, number one, it won't be interesting. Number two, it won't be lifelike. Um, and number three, we have a tendency to identify with the subversive character whether we like it or not. But in uh, The Robert Bride, there are many bad characters, many bad mothers, for example, I think. Uh, the three women have all been more or less abused during their childhood. Their mothers were not the war warm and understanding uh, person's mothers ought to be. And that accent you put upon an unhappy childhood seems to indicate that you consider that uh, condition to be susceptible to the xenia in ourselves. Is that right? I think that's quite appropriate. In other words, Xenia can't get into your life unless you in some way allow her in. And if you're completely impregnable, of course you won't want anything from such a person and you won't let her in. But, you know, this is just... But you're more easily victimized when you have had an unhappy childhood or a bad mother? I don't know whether I would make that as a sweeping generalization. Uh, as I said in my speech, Novels are not sociology textbooks. Let me add, they're also not psychology textbooks. In fact, they're not textbooks. They're <laughs> so you can't derive, from reading a novel, you can't derive sweeping general life principles from them, I don't think. But all three of them have been abused, so it seems to be... Well, they haven't, they haven't been, I mean, abused to, to North American means sexually abused. And this is not true. Is, is yeah, only one of them is. One. The other two are not. One of them old. had an in, had a mother who ran away with another man, and one of them had a mother who was. Uh, I wouldn't say she was indifferent. She was a cleaning addict. Mm -hmm. She was very interested in germs, and uh, that is typical for that period. If you go back and read the women's magazines, you will be amazed at how many advertisements for germ-killing products there are in the 40s and early 50s. It was the big age of laundry soap and stuff you poured down the drain, much more so than now. Uh, so, that, so there were a lot of people who actually were quite obsessed with <coughs> scrubbing things. But about a childhood in Cat's Eye, you described Elaine Risley, an artist returning to the city of her youth, or to know what, as uh, Tony would say, probably because she uh, changes the names of uh, things. Uh, and walking through that changed city, she remembers her childhood. She grew up in a happy family with a somewhat eccentric father and mother, but a very nice older brother. Nothing wrong there, but not prepared, I would say, for the real world outside that the queen of familiar bliss. She is traumatized by her friends, her peers. Elaine Risley is saved, you could say, because of that happy family. Uh, Ross, Chris, and Tony and the Robert Wright do not have friends that traumatize them. They don't seem to have friends at all. But they have a family that does it. Uh, and those three women seem to be saved by a friendship for each other. Why can't we have both? And well, we can have hell? both. We can have both, but if we have both in a novel, it's likely to get somewhat tedious, <laughs> as I've pointed out. <laughs> you know, they grow up so in a happy family, they have nice friends, they have <laughs> breakfast, they then have, they grow up, they have more nice friends, the nice friends help them out. They have happy families of their own. They have nice kids. But they have it be very interesting if something happens to those happy people? Well, then you get the Martians. I mean, if, <laughs> if as I say, you either, you either have to have uh, the bad thing coming from within human beings that are, that are known, 
by the characters, or they have to be from outside. So we could have the Martians invade, we could have World War III, we could have uh, sharks learning to walk and taking over the land, I think that would be good. But you can't have everybody in a novel being happy all the time. No, it just that's gets not what I mean, oh, good. But, during, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's entitled either or. You say either you have a happy family, then you have bad friends, or you have. Uh, I've got bad lots family, of characters who don't have either. Mm -hmm. For instance, in my first novel, they don't have families or friends. They're just stuck in the present. <laughs> They don't have a past, they don't go into the past. And it's possible to have a novel like that, in which you don't have the pasts of the characters, you just show them operating from the present moment on, and we are left to deduce their pasts. Uh, but since the robber bride covers 50 years of time, somehow the childhoods do get into it. You said Maybe I could have someone who has amnesia. Then you don't have to deal with their child. <laughs> you said it's hard to find a good man nowadays. What do you mean I by think that? it's Roz who says that. Yes, but you said it in an interview yourself. <laughs> oh, no, no, you said it in an interview yourself. Oh, uh, you, oh, come, come, come. Now, now look at, 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 now look at. You're a writer. Now, you know. How many things that appear in newspapers purporting to be interviews with you have you actually said? Well, most of the things I said, yes. yes. <laughs> well, I have had things that have appeared in interviews with me that I never said at all. So I'll have to, I would have to say the interview and the context. I think I was probably saying something like, people don't know what a good man is anymore. Do you? What? No, what a good man is. I'm not God, you know, nor do I purport to be. I, I think the point is that there used to be fairly clear standards. A good man was a man who, this, 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 this. Uh, then a lot of those things were called into cr question, and nothing has yet replaced them, so that neither women nor men have a clear standard of what, quotes a good man is good man used to take care of his family, never cry, have a stiff upper lip, do what a man's got to do, hunt down the desperados, uh, hold the bridge like Horatius, all of those things. So it goes for a woman too, of course. It's, it's hard to find a woman and to know what a good woman is nowadays. Well, I think women have been more busily writing about that than men have been writing about what it is to be a good man. Uh, we so through, we writing gives a, a solution to that question? Some kinds of writing. I think when I said women have been more busily writing about that, I wasn't so much thinking about novels as about the tremendous amount of print uh, that has been expanded in women's magazines and non-fiction books redefining the roles of women. but. I think that there is some confusion in that department too because just take for instance the issue of motherhood. Early 70s, mom was out. Not good to be mom anymore. Uh, then some of those 70s feminists became mothers and we had a lot of books about what it was to be a mother and that it was okay to be a mother again but not of the kind of mother of which they disapproved, namely their own. <laughs> they were going to be a new kind of mother namely the kind that they were. And uh, <laughs> so I, there has been a lot of redefinition of that kind going on. But I think the problem has been particularly dire for men, and that explains the tremendous success of a book like Iron John. Because I think whatever you may think of it, and whatever you may think of the poems uh, sprinkled throughout, um, it was addressing a, a, a vacuum a vacuum that had been left when people laughed at the Boy Scouts and uh, threw out male heroism and uh, paterfamilias behavior. Uh, about the act of creation, back to you yourself. 
herself again. She, I quote from Bodily Harm, she is a control freak, Tippi said. She is controlling the interview. You've got to turn it around, get an angle on her. Our readers want them to be human too. A few cracks in the armor, a little pain. Didn't she have to suffer on her way up? I asked her that, said Remy. She didn't, I quote. Did you? Did I suffer? Oh, <laughs> oh Nelica. Is suffering I know. Okay. necessary yes. for okay. creation? Let me put it this way. A young writer came to me and said, I understand that in order to be a really good writer, I have to suffer. And I said, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> this will come, <laughs> whether you want it to or not. I don't think you have to go out and look for it. Uh, everybody is a human being in this room and uh, human beings have emotions and bodies. So I would say that a certain amount are just built in. However, I don't, uh, I don't endorse the romantic view that writers or artists suffer more than other people. Or should suffer more. Or should suffer more, or do suffer more. I think lots of other people suffer a great deal, and a great deal more. I think the difference is that the artist articulates the suffering and the other person does not. So has literature a power to change and to have some effect upon the suffering of other people? Judging from the mail that one gets, yes, but not in a, not in a uh, directly instrumental way. That is, some books are how-to books and you read them and then you go out and do the thing that they say to do and it really does change the way you do things. With writing, it's more like this. I got a lot of letters from Cat's Eye and what the letters contained was people saying, I'd forgotten about these events in my childhood until I read your book. It brought it all back. And then they told the most amazing stories, which if I had only known, I would have made uh, Elaine's friends in Cat's Eye even more horrible than they were. <laughs> These were people writing about their little friends, packing them into snowbanks, throwing them into the river, locking them in closets, and all kinds of other uh, bad behavior. So I think what it does is it, it puts people sometimes it connects them with emotions that they have forgotten about or repressed and allows them to somehow relive a part of their life that has been papered over. And that seems to be cathartic. So in that way, I would say yes. Uh, people, and I'm sure you've had this experience yourself, people will say, reading your book changed my life. And then you try to get out of them how it changed their life. And there isn't a how. There isn't a how. There's, it's not a verb, it's a noun. It's, it's changed somehow the, how they see things, or um, changed an outlook, or it's changed their relationships with, with themselves, but it hasn't enabled them to go out and get a job. If you see what the difference, I'm sure you do, and I'm sure you've had this experience a lot of times. Final question, maybe, because time is up. People have to go uh, back to the station, maybe back home. Um, what shall I make the final question? Um, this one. Art. It's not a question. It's a statement. <laughs> so. Reaction maybe to it. Art is a desperate attempt to make friends. What <laughs> <laughs> can we say? Well, I suppose it depends on the verb make. No, as a <laughs> as in God making 
add a mode of dust. I mean, you do create people. Um, possibly the person who wrote that meant something else, i.e. you make art, you send it into the world, and then people become your friends. I, it doesn't work that way. Um, if, if she meant, are we, are right, writers... Why do you suppose it's a she? No. Why do I suppose it's a she? Yeah, that, isn't that silly of me? Okay, this, this he, her, uh, this her, he, um, may have meant that we're all walking around the room talking to imaginary people the way that children do when they're four. I have a friend called Bobby and he's sitting in that chair. Um, I think we probably need to question further the person who wrote this down to find out what he, she meant. I don't think art is a, is a desperate attempt to make friends. I think it's a desperate attempt to, to create order out of chaos. I mean, my ambitions are much bigger than that. I'm, with, I'm, I'm at verse 1 of Genesis, not, <laughs> not verse 7. <laughs> An attempt to be God. Uh, no, an attempt to imitate God, perhaps, in that you're making a ca an order out of chaos. But Best of course, order out of chaos than you did. Oh no, 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 no. Uh, simply an ordering of something that is by nature incohate and formless and impossible to pin down, namely life. And art makes a little order out of that, but of course, as we all know, it's an artificial order because you can't put everything in. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. <laughs>